back to the Boy Family. It's your favorite coach, Coach Jeffrey. I'm here with another amazing guest. I have a new friend, Nicole Biscotti. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Great. So, Nicole, tell our listening audience a little bit more about you. Yes, thank you. I'm a teacher, an author, and a speaker, and a mama. I write primarily about ADHD. I wrote a book with my nine-year-old son at the time called I Can Learn When I'm Moving, Going to School with ADHD. It was inspired by Jason and what he felt as a child with ADHD, which spurred me on to learn more about what are strategies that work, not just for ADHD, but for all learners. Because it can be very challenging as a teacher to try to accommodate each and every learner when we have so many. Differentiation is always like the holy grail of teaching, right? Yes. So I, we wrote this book together and it, it's based and includes a lot of voices of other teachers. That's cool. That's pretty cool. So let's talk a little bit about your teaching career. And you said that you were a teacher as well. I know you're in a unique situation. That's a little bit why our internet is a little frozen, but that's good. It's still a good thing. We're international. So let's talk about where you are now. Absolutely. So I'm actually in Mexicali, Baja California. So I am just about eight miles or seven miles south of the border in Mexico, and I teach in California. Well, my next book is about kids with ADHD that are undetected because they have the additional challenge of language and cultural barriers that they're facing. So, Nicole, are you bilingual? Yes, I am. That's amazing. My head goes off to you. I've been living in Texas all my life, and unfortunately, I'm still not bilingual yet, but I do admire educators who do take that step. So what do you teach in California? I teach Spanish. So I'm Puerto Rican and Italian. So I grew up hearing Spanish and Italian. Unfortunately, I'm not fluent by any means in Italian at all, but I am fluent in Spanish. So you live in Mexico and then you drive across the border and then you teach, correct? Correct. In a California school. In a California school. So in the United States, that's a really political situation that you are actually educating students in. To one degree, we have a group of people that says that students need to stay in their home countries. And we have people who say that we should educate all. And here you are a teacher who is an American citizen, but lives in Mexico, who drives across the border to teach American students. What is that dynamic like? Catch me at five o'clock in the morning. That is a little hectic. But other than that, I think, <laughs> to be honest with you, myself and my children enjoy the best of both worlds, if I were to be honest, because the rents in California are a little high. <laughs> Real estate's a little crazy lately. So we do get to enjoy the benefits here in Mexico. But beyond any economic benefits culturally, and think my children are fortunate because they're getting to live in two worlds, quite literally. And yeah, quite now as an educator, I'm also seeing, going from my, but now I'm seeing where children with ADHD or with any special needs are coming from a whole different cultural background. But yet when I go to school, I see where how we act, in my mind, act like they're born when they cross the border. Mm -hmm. We don't take into consideration where they're coming from. So their expectations are, what their parents' expectations are in terms of the support that we could be providing at the school and what cultural support they already had in place. We just gotcha. start from the beginning with them. So right. that's what I'm really a lot about right now. Yeah. There are certain forms of the mainstream media who would say that students who come from across the border are behind American students. And you live in a community in which you, you travel back and forth. What is your experience on the needs for students that you taught? I don't agree with that at all. I think that there's different strengths. If we're going to, if we're going to generalize, which we're generalizing for the purpose of the discussion, of course, the children that I see that are educated in Mexico are generally much more respectful. Sure. <laughs> we can talk about this the more respectful traditional values, which I'm really hoping is going to rub off on my children. I would love a little of that, but no, I really do appreciate their more, <laughs> the more genuine human connections that they are more comfortable forming still 
in this culture here that I'm experiencing. And I feel that there's a competitive, there's a competitiveness that children from all different countries have are facing that American children don't face to the same extent. So they know that they have to be sharp. They know that they have to really stand out if they want to succeed. Whereas in the United States, to a large extent, if you just do okay, you're going to have pretty good light. So there, there is a little bit more of, of a competitiveness that, that children are forced to have. I also, yeah. in terms of the ADHD research, and I'm having a lot of really interesting conversations with educators this summer here, that I'm seeing is that in Latin culture, there tends to be more of a focus on less on individualism and more on collectivism. And that transcends into how they handle special needs. And what I'm really liking is that there's a lot of focus with teachers. And this is something I've always felt was lacking. And I've written quite a bit about is that not just supporting the kid with ADHD, but supporting all the other kids in the classroom. So obviously we're not going to say, hey, Jason has ADHD, so he might act up a little bit. But to let the other kids know, sometimes Jason does get angry quickly. I see that. But this is maybe how he's feeling. Or do you notice if you just give him a couple minutes, he might get a little quieter or settle down. So just to really support the rest of the children, which I think is really yeah. important. Yeah. And I think that your title of your book is something that captivates me as well. I can learn when I'm moving. Let's move into that realm because you are a parent and a teacher. But what makes you title your book, I can learn when I'm moving? Because Jason kept saying that. Sure. That was something that he said several times during conversations. I always had Jason come to IEP meetings or actually they weren't IEP meetings. They were, I forgot what they used to call them. He eventually ended up with a 504, but all those meetings that we had and he would say, but I can learn when I'm moving. I can still learn. I can listen. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Your son came up with that title and then for him to have enough cognition to know that he can learn as soon as while he's moving, isn't that a really good practice for children in general. It is. And that's two things that I always touch on right there. Number one, we have a lot of assumptions about what children need to be doing when they're learning. So I think most of us were brought up to believe that if a kid's quiet and seated at their desk with all of their supplies, neat, clean, fed, et cetera, et cetera, whatever the list is that we hit up, then the kid is learning or ready mm -hmm. to learn. But that's not true. And we have to be flexible about what learning looks like. I remember the fidget spinners. Some kids wanted to be on with the fidget spinners. Some kids doodle. Some kids need to be on a bouncy ball. Kids that are learning, they don't necessarily have to look like what we think they have to look like to be really learning. And then the other thing is that we have to also be willing to give them choice in how they want to approach the material and process. Man, I love that a lot. So you said that you have conversations with other educators this summer, and I was one of the educators who you had conversations with. I appreciate you for inviting me or whoever invited me to that group. I, I love it on Saturday mornings once a month. I wish it was more, but how did that get started? And what do you call that collaborative process? Well, we talk about these types of things. How did that get started? Honestly, that was just my crazy idea. And that's been really cool to me because yeah, sometimes you have an idea and you think, I wonder if this would work. It's really been neat to see that others have enjoyed it. I do enjoy the structured chats and I've participated and I've led a lot of them on Twitter. But I was starting to feel like, I know everyone's a little zoomed out, but at the same time, it would be cool to just share space and just have coffee and talk with educators just in different places in the world, across the country. So I just put it out there on Twitter and at first Melody thought I was talking about another chat and she was like, well, I don't really like chat. <laughs> and Melody and I are friends, Melody McAllister. And I was like, Melody, it's not a chat idea. Her or texting her. So yeah. like, that's not what I'm talking about. Like, really, she's like, oh, I thought it was in a chat. That's just like, can we just share space? I guess I didn't explain it well. So then she liked the idea and she wanted to so I'll do it with you. And I was like, that's even cooler because she knows everybody. Yeah, so that's how yeah. it started. And we started doing it once a month, but I would definitely like to do it more often. 
I know, man. I do you listen? Let me can I just tell a quick story? Yeah, it's uh, been really neat. It's been really fun. I had to go to a function as a principal, and I really hated to leave that chat to go to that function as a principal. So I was really getting a lot of value out of the conversation that we had. I just want to thank you for having that collaboration space. I think it's very important, and I was learning a lot and engaging a lot and doing one of my favorite things, drinking. Right? Yeah, that PLN coffee talk. Maybe we should do it twice a month. I think we should. It was very validating for me also just to see how a lot of educators are facing some of the same things that we were. And then like we were constructing, deconstructing some of the issues that we were facing and why. And some of the comments that you made really stuck with me, like kind of talking about how the political divisions have filtered down into the classroom. And that's what we're seeing with some of these behaviors. It really stuck with me like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's crazy. He also too, I appreciate really you bringing really your administrator. You brought your principal in. Yeah, he's really cool, though. Like, not every principal would want to be like, it's your principal, and you went, but he's my principal. <laughs> he was looking sick. Yeah, that's... Who wants I to brought my boss. boss. <laughs> More, like, seriously, like, that That was... But you know what? I also learned a lot from him while we were also able to be there. And I think that is... So when you talk about, in your book, like, I can learn when I'm moving, I actually think this pandemic is a moving target as well for us as well. And so I think that as we move forward throughout the course of education, that there's going to be some new learning that happens. And so your son was so insightful to come up with that title because I think it it really just plays for where we're headed in education. I sure hope so. I love how what you said about, let's, what, what, how did you word that about not going back to Egypt? What yeah, that's an old story, that, that an old Hebrew story that is found out, I'm pretty sure, when Moses got to the edge of the water and people were looking and they saw that, they saw the ocean and then they saw that they had been chased by the army and it was like, look, you can't go back. Like this, we got to move forward. And so that's just a mindset that a leader and today's pandemic is just going to have to go because now there's a new pandemic. COVID on top of, they got down here and started to spread monkey pox. Like, what is that? Where did that even come from? I have no idea. <laughs> but I do know that COVID and all of the horror that it brought to humanity did get us thinking about different things and get us collaborating with different people and willing to share space through Zoom and use different technologies and very unfortunately seems to have at least shaken up education a little bit. So if we have people talking and looking at better ways to do things with all the damage it did, at least if we can take the good and move forward with it, I think we have to. I think we owe it to the people that went through so many bad things during. Yeah, we owe it to your son. Your side will literally say something that needs to happen after the pandemic is we need to refocus on how we educate children and learning while moving is a really good topic. What are some of the, give me a strategy that teachers can just use to have kids moving and to continue to learn. See, and that's the thing, because if we look at IEPs and 504s, we have all these accommodations and that's tough for teachers. I teach high school. So I have 160, 170 kids every year. It's hard for me to remember everybody's conditions, and I want to. I care. I'm not even resistant to it, but it's hard. But there's a lot of proactive things you can do in your instruction design and also in your classroom management and procedures, which I'm actually updating my website to include more resources for that. But the, I call them whole class accommodations. And one of them is really being heavily involved with kinesthetic learning. So oh. there's two ways to do that. One of them is just kinesthetic learning. So do you centers? We can do games. We can do activities. A lot of the kinesthetic activities that I've brought into my classroom, I just want to let you know that I thought would go over really well. And the kids were like, yeah, not so much, Ms. B. I don't really like that. But maybe if we did it more like this or we moved in this way, we'll work a little better. <laughs> so they've helped me refine them over the years. But really yeah. just being open-minded to having them move. And we know we have obesity crisis. We know we have less and less recess every We know kids need to be interacting and moving after the pandemic. So really, when we allow movement in the classroom, 
I think if we stop looking at, we all know that squirrely kid, like we all have a Jason, right? We all have that kid that just can't sit still. And rather than looking at them as the outlier, if you look at them as goals, I can get Jason to be involved in this lesson. I know I have everybody. Yeah. And yeah. I have everybody moving, which is healthy. So just to look at them as a target, because I'm good. Sure. <laughs> a goal. An outcome. How about that? The other thing I will. The other thing I wanted to say about movement is also that's in terms of instruction, but in terms of classroom management, we're very controlling as a profession about letting people move. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but we're like bossy about the bathroom, about getting water. Like we're really bossy about all that. You can't even get up sometimes. I don't, I don't have ADHD, but I remember being a little girl and breaking my pencil so I could go sharpen it. Just because I was like bored. Yeah. So just allowing kids to just have freedom to stretch or it's not a big deal if they want to go stand in the back of the class or if they want to go sit in a beanbag or sit in the carpet or just yeah. allowing movement in general. You said something that's very powerful to me. I think that as an educator, and I'm looking at myself, especially when I go in front of my staff, I'm going to focus on me being boring. Because I feel that when kids are bored, they express their bored in a way that ends up being misbehaviors or not paying attention to an activity. Same thing with teachers. And teachers are bored a lot of times when they spend time getting information from principals in a traditional way. So with principals make the mistake of, some principals make the mistake of, sitting and then they want the teachers to go into the classroom and be the sage on the stage. I think that needs to evolve. And so I think boredom at the core of this conversation, boredom is what's driving, what is driving as an indicator as driving something that can be changed in my life. I agree with you 1000%. I think that kids are acting up or when, even like when I get professional development at school, and the teachers aren't paying attention, rather than me taking it personally, I have to think, okay, they're done with that point, or maybe that point isn't that relevant to them. And sometimes it's really just asking questions like, do you guys really work with this area, or would you like to hear more about a different area? And people love it when you ask them frank questions like, what? Because they're like, oh God, thank you. I should be going to stop with that. So I, I think giving people a chance to learn about one thing that they're interested in. And that's what I love Barbara Bray's work. I'm a big fan of her and she's become a friend of mine, but she's really, and she came to our last PL and, um, coffee talk, but she's really into student choice and voice. And then yeah. now I'm talking about teacher voice and choice. But I think it really does down to that is giving people choice over content and process wherever possible. Mm -hmm. I always remember I'm 46. When I was, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that I remember when I was a kid waiting for Saturday morning cartoons, like I waited and then whatever they put on, I watched. And I remember the Wizard of Oz twice, oh, Wizard of Oz twice a year. That was like, I waited. Kids don't do that anymore. They're driving their content in a tablet or an iPad at the restaurant or two. They're not passive. They're just not, they don't even sit in like a doctor's office. It, do you remember like when we were kids, like it was like, you got to sit there and you got to be good now. They don't do that. They're always driving their own content. So for us to think that they're going to sit passively in a classroom while we talk, it's just not very realistic, quite honestly. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is astonishing over the last 25, 30 years at the way that students can consume and demand content from any content provider. But they will enter an economy where they will have on-demand economy and on-demand content that they can either consume or reject very quickly. And so that feedback is something that is very important. And I think also in the field of education, one of the things that we don't do well all the time is giving applicable time feedback so that because that is the engine that is driving learning. That is what's driving the kids' interest. And so that feedback piece, I think, is something that's overlooked Looking back at my own self and my own career, just giving that feedback of how they're learning, where do I want them to go from this next point? And you can do it a whole lot easier now than what you could back 25, 30 years ago. Because like you said, you just, you used to have to sit and wait. Now it's an expectation that you don't. It is. And it's a habit. 
they're just, that's the way that they're used to. And when you think about feedback, they're used to, we all know, they play video, kids play video games constantly. So they're used to constant feedback too. Or when they share photos or comments online, they're used to con quick feedback. So you're right. They're just used to that. That's the world that they're living in. And they're also, the pluses and there's negatives to it. They're also used to being able to take a lot of content and plow through it, if you will, at a much quicker rate than maybe we were. Yeah. And I think also, too, that's why a lot of platforms like a TikTok or Snapchat is even gaining more in popularity, even with people within our age group, is because of that instant feedback. Like you, you get a laugh or a chuckle or and, and then you can continue to feed that math problem, continue to feed you that information. Exactly. And that's always the challenge with education is that we have this desire to look at our classrooms, our classroom management and our instruction design through a lens of what we think it should be. And it's really coming from a desire to control things. And when we're willing to relinquish that control, we really begin to serve the children that we're supposed to serve. Yeah. Yeah. When you wrote your book, what is one chapter that you would like to share? Could you share one of the strategies that's in your book that we can get people to go ahead and purchase it? Even more of it. One, I'm not sure one strategy that stands out. That's a tough question. Got any? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean There's a lot of different things. It depends on what hits somebody. And you have stuck there. There's like myth busting about ADHD. There's like how to support the other kids in the class. There's proactive strategies in different subject areas. I'm not sure of one would say, oh, I know one. I got it. I got it. Differentiation. I had tackled differentiation in a way that I think is, okay, I'm just going to say this. If teachers go to professional development and they hear about differentiation, it sounds very lofty for most of them. Like it sounds, oh, that's a great idea, but I have 35 kids. Do they know I have 35 kids? And I, well, I'm going to give them all personalized learning. You're, you bet. That's how we feel. Like I'd love to, sure. So I really tackled that in my book head on about how we can do that, putting differentiation in the hand of the learner. Yeah. Man, that's really cool. I'm going to have to, I need to pick that up. I'm going to get your book. Um, did you publish that through Edubatch? I did. And if you send me your address later on, I'll send you, I have these little cards made that are like, it looks like the front of the book and we'll sign a message. To you. And I'll oh, yeah, this is great. I'm going to start, I'm going to start putting stuff around this room, stuff that I get from educators. I think it's a prize. I got a lot of books over here and some books over there too. And yeah, I like to collect books and get autographs and stuff. So that's really cool. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's been the coolest thing about finding Twitter and finding the PLN, in my opinion, is getting the privilege of meeting so many people with so many awesome ideas and perspectives and just really genuine educators that really care about kids. Yes, most definitely. I totally agree with you on that. Totally. Okay, Nicole. So this is winding down to the end of our show. Oh, Google's interrupting me now. So this is the end of our show. Can you tell our listening audience where can they find you at on social media? Absolutely. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook, NicoleBiscotti.com. Okay. And we can order your book there? Through Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I think it's through most of the bookstores, but it's through Edumatch Publishing. Excellent. Excellent. That's really great. Okay, Nicole, thank you for coming on the show. I got to get, we got to get you back. And I think the next coffee chat is coming up. Is it this Saturday? No, we actually, you know, this Saturday is Melody's anniversary. Isn't that cute? Oh, yeah. So yeah. we decided to do it on the next Saturday. Yeah, I thought that was cool. So it's going to be, I believe it's the 13th, but I'll put out an announcement. Okay, great. I'm looking forward to doing it. And I'm actually going to start buying coffee cups. There is a guy, my ed tech life. He has a, sh a, a thing called mug shots and I love his idea. So I think when I join other people's podcasts, I'm just going to have different mugs. So I just really like that idea. That's really cool. But thank you again for putting that. Thank you. You just gave me an idea. Maybe I should get stickers and send them out to you guys and we could have PL and coffee talk. 
on our hey. <laughs> yes that hey now that right there that'll be really cool that'd be really cool and like he was hitting me on the sticker game because i really i didn't really didn't know about that miguel uh, he uh, designs his own stickers and all the other kind of stuff and i follow him i follow a bunch of people but he inspires me to create content him claudio zavala albert thomas it's a bunch of good people who just make good educational content. And so I really like watching those guys and trying to be like them when I grow up. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. And cool. we did not talk about your podcast. You're getting ready to start a podcast again. Yes, I am. So Melissa Sidebotham and I have the Edge Table podcast. We paused it for a while through the pandemic and we had some life changes she and I, but we're ready to get back at it. So we're planning some really good episodes coming up. They can catch the old ones they're on, but we're, I'm really excited about the ones coming up. We're really going to start talking about some pretty controversial issues in education. We're just taking it head on panel style, getting people on with different views. And hopefully we can bring back the art of civil discourse. Uh, that is, is a lost art. Yeah. That's a lost art with on-demand education. Yeah, very exactly. That is a lost art. Thank you again for coming on the show, and we'll get you on again. And hopefully you have a great year, and I wish you the best. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking the time to have me on your show, and it was great talking to you, and I wish you a great year as well. Thank you. In 2023, the education landscape will have unprecedented innovation and creativity with original ideas flourishing everywhere educators can look forward to being engaged in more meaningful ways than ever before thanks to authentic approaches that provide just the right dose of individuality and imagination at the same time ethical considerations will become increasingly more important so you have my word that i will stay fresh original and authentic so like we always do about this time, let's collaborate, communicate, and educate with the best educators in the world right here on Flipboard EDU Podcast.